Good evening, everyone. It's so good to be with you once again tonight. It's such a great pleasure to be part of, of this congregation, you know. I really enjoy it more and more, actually. I get to know more of you, I get to talk to more of you and spend some time with you and we're becoming a family, even though we didn't know each other before I came. So it's good to be here and I, I really am looking forward to tonight, to our conversation tonight. It is indeed true that I play that instrument, I used to play that instrument, I should say. I grew up with a father who played a soul. And um, it wasn't always a pleasant experience. <laughs> but I learned to play the soul. And this is kind of a curiosity. My father would, usually when he would play this, he would, on, a, on a scene, he would cut a piece of wood and then he would play. So this was just kind of a nice thing. And he taught me how to play. And I tried to play it at home, but my family doesn't like it. <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of gave up. It's an interesting instrument, though, interesting instrument. Well, we've gone through several interesting topics. This place is be be beginning to be cluttered, don't you think? It's kind of, it's, we're almost done, almost done here. So, do you remember where we began? What was the sermon number one? What was this all about? Ah, oh, this rain will stop in a moment, I'll hear you better. So, what, what are we saying with this? that we are anointed, all of us are anointed to be Jesus' Messiahs. So, like he treats people, that, that's, a, that's what we should do, right? And then we talked about the paradigm shift, right? That God announces something brand new. And what, what is this brand new that's supposed to come? It is his church, right? By the blood of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we had water. We talk a lot about water. Water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit as much as oil is. There's a new paradigm. And that church is something brand new that is going to okay in history of the world. And we are going to experience something brand new. And then we talked yesterday about this. Remember? What was that all about? What does it say here? Oh, you need to be louder. I'm not hearing. Can you say it again? Three, four. Okay. Everyone together. Excellent. Very good. And what does it mean, though? I mean, what, there's one thing to know what it means, another thing to apply in your life. Right? Okay. Not so with you. Jesus said that we should not think of ourselves better than we should, okay? And that God was, Jesus came and served us. He applied the two lowly terms to himself, slave and servant. And we needed to know this about God in order to exemplify in the, this in the church because God calls us to be that towards one another, to fulfill his dream. So now that we know something about God, we need to know about his modus operandi, or the way God operates. Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about God's grace. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, in this evening hour, as we are hearing the droplets of the rain pouring upon the upon this tent we are reminded that water represents the Holy Spirit I know that you already here we're feeling your presence and you're giving us a sign that you are here through this rain thank you Jesus thank you for being here through your Holy Spirit we're going to talk about a difficult topic today it's supposed to be easy but it is difficult for us sometimes so I pray that you give me wisdom you open our hearts, anoint my lips, so that you will be glorified here tonight. This is my prayer, in Jesus' name. Amen. As Seventh-day Adventists, we should be very familiar with the idea of God's grace. After all, we belong to a group of denominations which refers to itself as Protestants, correct? 
We are Protestants, right? Our theological roots are deeply in the 16th century Protestant Reformation. And Protestant Reformation was just about, all of it was about God's grace. That doesn't mean that they get, that reformers got everything right. But the grace of God was at the forefront of their thinking for very good reason. We're going to explore this in a moment. Grace is part of Adventist message. It's part of three angels' message. You know, when you look at that verse, all right, what's happening here? Oh, it's not working. Oh, okay, all right. Very good, now it's working. When we look at this all-important passage, all-important chapter for Adventism, what we see here is, then I saw another angel flying in mid-air, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. So the three angels' messages are about the eternal gospel. And even the verse 12, when we, uh, where we hear about commandments, keeping the commandments, it's all about the gospel, as you shall see in a few moments. So eternal gospel is all about God's grace. That's what the gospel is. It's a gospel about God's grace. And yet, we as Adventists, have kind of ambivalent relationship with grace. When we talk about grace, we approach it with some kind of distrust and uncertainty. On the one hand, grace is a wonderful thing, you know. Salvation by grace through faith, wonderful gift of God. We speak about it during our Bible studies. We listen, but we've studied this during our Sabbath school lessons. We read articles in the record. On the other hand, when we speak about salvation sola gratia, or by grace alone, sola fide, by faith alone, that this is a free gift, we can become nervous, ill at ease, somewhat uncomfortable. Isn't that true? It is an interesting theory, but be careful in practice. So I'm a third generation Adventist. I'm a son of a pastor. I'm a pastor myself. I often heard sentiments like this throughout my ministry. I've been in ministry for 31 years, and this is what I hear occasionally, or quite often actually. This pastor only speaks of God's grace. What about keeping the commandments? What about obedience? Have you heard something like this? Yeah, I have heard this. Or other Protestants speak of grace and neglect obedience. We have a special message. Yeah, I've heard that too. Or... If you speak too much about God's grace, Adventist standards will go down, right? That's, I've heard that too. And then I hear about cheap grace. I believe God saved me by grace so I can do what I want. It doesn't matter how I behave, how I live, that's the cheap grace. Have you heard some? Yes, what's happening? Have you heard sentiments like this? Okay, thank you. So we've got those things. And the problem is, when you put those two together, cheap grace, then very quickly the cheap will devour the grace. Completely will devour grace. So I'd like to propose something to you today. That we should never, ever, never, ever utter those two words together. Because we unintentionally demean God's grace what God did for us. So when you hear somebody say the phrase, I need to make a covenant with you. When you hear somebody ever say cheap grace, you say, stop them. Please stop. Tell them, no, 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 no. You can't say cheap grace. Those two words don't belong together. This is a desecration of grace. It cheapens the grace. Do you know how it works? It cheapens the grace when you put those two words together. It makes people afraid of God's grace. Don't put those two words together because you do God a disservice. It will be like I would say to my daughter, you are a, an ugly child. You know, I'm looking at my daughter, 20 year old, and I would say to her, you are an ugly child. What would that do to her? It would be a terrible thing to do. It would be demeaning for her. Please, don't ever, don't ever put together the word cheap and grace 
together. Never ever. Because the true biblical grace is never cheap. Someone paid a great price. Do you know anything about Bougainvilleas? It's an awful tree. I loved it though because outside of my office I had this amazing, beautiful bougainvillea at home because I've been working at home. So I'd go to my office, I'd look out, and have this beautiful bougainvillea. Just about a month ago, there was a windstorm in Morissette, and that bougainvillea went down. And I said to myself, "Oh no!" So we spent my wife and I spent the entire Sunday cleaning up that bougainvillea, cutting it. Cutting it with chainsaw, cutting it with, and then putting it all the bin. Guess what happened to our hands, our knees,、uh, our bodies? Even though we wore shoes and we wore gloves, what happens to you? It just—it's a terrible tree. It's a beautiful to look, so long you don't touch it. If you touch it, it's just terrible. Those thorns are terrible invention. But I tell you something: we spent the entire Sunday with my wife cleaning. That bougainvillea. It was a huge tree, and all the time we thought about one thing. This afternoon, I went for a hunt for branches of bougainvillea, so I found few, and I like to show you what I thought about. When I was putting this together, my hands got punctured. This was on. The head of Christ, something like this, and it was only a part of His suffering. Don't ever put those two words together. Cheap grace. Get this out of your vocabulary. Those two words do not belong together. Please, I'll leave it for you here so that you remember this. From God's perspective, grace is never cheap. The truth is, and I've discovered this in my ministry, the more emphasis we place on our behavior, the more we forget about God's grace. The more we forget about God's grace, the more problems, conflicts, and troubles we're going to have in our churches. If we are serious about fulfilling God's dream for our church, Jesus' dreams for the church. If we want to follow Jesus, we do not have a choice. Preaching about God's grace must become an integral part of our proclamation of three angels' messages, and we must not be apologetic about this. To go a little bit deeper into the study of grace, I'd like to take you on a little bit of a journey. I would like to invite my old friend Martin Luther to help me with this. So. I would like to go back to this verse. If you have your Bibles, you may open your Bibles. It will be great. I love when people bring Bibles to、uh, to church, okay, and to meetings like this. And I'd like to tell you about this passage, the history of this passage, just a little bit to understand what happened. This passage gave many, many troubles to Luther. It was the most troubling passage for him. So let us just read it, okay? So this is Romans chapter one and verse. One verse sixteen. This is what the what Paul says here. I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel a righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That one sentence that you see highlighted in red in the middle. Is probably the most controversial sentence in entire history of Christianity. This is what the Reformation was really all about. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. For Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, understanding this passage changed everything. You see, in Luther's day, the church taught that people are not good enough. They just said you are not good enough, 
And this was the mantra, because you are not good enough, you have to do something. You're not good enough, uh, and uh, Jesus' sacrifice is not good enough, so you have to pay. You have to buy those indulgences, you have to go to church, you have to go through the sacramental ways and so on, because, because you're not good enough. You have to work in order to be good enough. And in that way, the Catholic Church held power over people. It was a good way of fundraising when you told people they're not good enough. You know, the entire basilica, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome was built on the premise that church members are not good enough. And church could get the money f that, uh, that's, uh, in the way from people when the church teaches that, not, that people are not good enough. So Luther is asking questions. He's asking a big question. Am I good enough? Am I good enough? What more can I do to please God? Have I obeyed God's commandments to please God? Have I obeyed enough? Listen to Luther for a moment. I have on the screen? No. Listen to Luther just for a moment. A question that troubled me constantly. Have I done enough? My conscience could achieve, never achieve certainty, but was always in doubt and said, you have not done this correctly. You were not contrite enough. You omitted this in your prayer. The longer I tried to heal my uncertain, weak, and troubled conscience, the more uncertain, weak, and troubled it became. Despite prayer vigils, fasts, and other most severe exercises with which I afflicted myself nearly to death as a monk, doubts still remain in my mind. And I thought, who knows if these things are pleasing to God? Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love. Yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, I was angry with God. And I said, as if it is not enough that miserable sinners are crushed by every kind of calamity, by the law of the Decalogue, without having God add pain to pain by threatening us with his righteousness and wrath. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. You can read about his trouble in great controversy. Ellen White presents it quite well. Maybe none of you have experienced this kind of thing like Luther did, which I just read. But have you ever worried in your life if you are good enough? Have you ever worried? Have you asked myself, have you asked yourself, am I good enough for God? That have I obeyed well enough? Was my obedience good enough? In the midst of the deepest agony, God opened Luther's eyes. And when he opened Luther's eyes, the Reformation began. Let's go back to the text and explore Luther's discovery. Very briefly here. So, the question here is this phrase. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. This phrase can be read in two ways. And both ways are grammatically correct. Okay, so you read the one way and you get one understanding, you read another way, and you get another understanding. So first of all, you can read it righteousness of God. I'm going to explain this in a moment. And secondly, you can read it as righteousness from God. And depending on how you read, whether of God or from God, you've got two ways of being saved, two different ways of being saved, two different ways of understanding salvation. So let me explain this in a, in a simple way. So I've got a tool here that is my favorite tool. You know, I, I like to tinker at home with all kinds of things. I like to renovate a little bit here, build here, do this and that. And without this, I don't think I would survive. I've got probably six of those things at home. And this is red, this is visible. But, and I've got both feet and meters and so on. But uh, I will use it today not for building something, but to illustrate. Okay, so here is a standard, all right? And here's meter, all right? How do I know that this is a correct one meter? How do I know this? You know, how do I know this, all right? 
I trust, right? <laughs> I trust that this is a meter. How come I trust? Okay, I trust because somewhere in France, there is a building that has an original meter in that building. Okay, this is near Paris. There is a special uh, science center when they hold a special type of metal, two, actually two types of metal, and there's exact meter there, that, that every other meter is measured against that meter. So I know that this is a meter, so this is a, this is a standard, okay? So what happens is, you can imagine, that God is this box here, he's in this box right here, this is his righteousness, and I'm here, I'm beginning my Christian journey right here, with God. I become converted, okay? And God and I are beginning to work towards my salvation. So I'm told this is a standard, okay? You have to climb up a little bit by bit, climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up, until you are good enough to be accepted by God. Are you catching the drift, okay? So you've got the standard, and you have to fulfill the standard. You have to do as God gave us that standard. At some point, when I'm on my journey, God will check me up how well I've done, all right? And then God will make a decision on what to do with me. You know, the frequent result of this kind of approach is uncertainty. Have I done enough? Have I been good enough? Does God really love me if I am here and not here? I'm supposed to be here. Does God love me if I'm here? If I'm here, I know who I am. I, don't, I know that I don't obey perfectly. I am, I'm, uh, will God love me if I'm here and not here? You know, as a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor once. Very often from young people I heard, I'm not good enough for God and I don't think I'll ever be. I'm just unable to reach God's standards. But you know, this is not just young people. I think that some of you here also feel the same thing. Am I good enough? Am I good enough? Am I, will God love me if I'm here and not here? It is difficult to love such a God. The expectation is too high. And it's not surprising that Luther absolutely hated him hated that kind of a God. You see, he, you, can, you can see his words, for I hated the word righteousness of God with which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. When I was a pastor, after my education years in, in, in America, I came to Tasmania and I met a lot of people there who were ex-Adventists. And you know, invariably, I heard the same Reference. I told you that I tried to reach the non -advent, the ex-Adventists. I thought it was an easy way to fill up my churches, you know. But then I discovered this thing. People would tell me this is continual refrain. I can't come to church. I have to fix my life first. I'm not good enough to come to church. For two years I worked with one particular person in one of my churches. And I, I had weekly meetings with him and trying to convince him about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was, I've got unclean hands. I can't. If I come to church, the walls will fall on me. I am not good enough to come to church. I heard this over and over from many people. And you know, I can understand it to some extent. I can understand it from my own upbringing. My own upbringing, I grew up in Poland was quite legalistic. I remember when I was a child of two or three, I was punished for using scissors on Sabbath. You know, because it was work to use scissors on Sabbath. Uh, we didn't have good materials uh, in Polish language at that stage. Poland was a pretty poor communist country behind the Iron Curtain. So occasionally we got materials from the TED, Trans-European Division. They would send us books for children so that Sabbath school teachers could teach children using the books. And uh, nobody could speak English. Those books were not translated. So the teachers in Sabbath school would use the pictures in those books to teach about salvation, about God. And in those books, one of those pictures was this. And I remember, my, when I was seven, eight year old, I remember my teacher, Sabbath school teacher, saying this, one day 
you will find yourself in that very spot. You'll be standing before that angel, and that angel will quiz you and will be asking you about your life in depth. He'll be asking about all your sins. And he'll be saying, are you sure you confess those sins? And so on and so on and so on. You know what? For much of my young years and growing up as a teenager, I was terrified. I was terrified. I had dreams about imagining myself standing like that man before that angel. And that angel, if you look closely, his face is not pleasant. This is a not a nice guy. So I, I, I had nightmares about this as a young growing up. That's, that's how I was taught. That was downright scary. You see, my, in my work as a pastor, I see many people who view God in this way. This is the picture of righteousness of God. That God looks down from us, there is a certain standard, and God expects us to fulfill that standard until we find ourselves acceptable to Him. And then He will check on us whether we're good enough. But the same passage can be read grammatically in another way. And this was the Luther's breakthrough. This is the great paradigm shift from the off into from. And suddenly, everything is completely different. Praying, despairing, and focusing on this passage, Luther understood that Paul was not writing about righteousness according to to which God compares us to him, according to the righteousness he judges us by, but it is about his righteousness that he simply gives us as his gift. Instead of expecting us to fulfill the law, God did it himself through Jesus. In other words, it is God through Christ that satisfied, listen carefully, God the Christ that satisfied the requirement for us, the condition of our salvation. Obedience is a requirement to get to heaven. God did it. When Luther got it, he suddenly understood that phrase, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. So, once again, coming back to the measure, the standard is the same. Standard is exactly the same. God established the standard. It's unchangeable. God wants us to be saved. He wants us to, be, to go to heaven, but he knows our hopeless situation. He knows that we ask question, am I good enough? This is the most common Christian question. Am I good enough? And God has a simple answer to that question, I'm sad to say. He says, you are not good enough. You are not good enough. More, you will never be good enough. More, your obedience will never be good enough. After all, didn't God say that in Isaiah 64, 6 and many other passages, all our righteous acts are like what? So even if I'm here, it will still be filthy rags. Even I'm here, it's still filthy rags because all my righteous acts are as filthy rags. And I don't want to tell you what the Hebrew word is there for filthy rags. It's a very nasty word. Very nasty word. And, and God could not have said his message stronger. So God has to find a solution. Do you remember the story from Genesis 22? It's a famous story. I don't have time to tell you about it. But it is who provided in that story, right? Who provided? Who rescued Isaac? It was God who rescued Isaac. And this is why God is called, do you remember the name of God? Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Yireh. It means God is the provider, God alone. So in Genesis 22 verse 14, we find those words. And Abraham called the place Yahweh Yireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. You know, it was a hopeless situation for Abraham and Isaac. Very hopeless situation. But note one thing. They were perfectly obedient, weren't they? Was Abraham perfectly obedient to the voice of God? Yes, he was. He took his son to the Mount Moriah. Was Isaac perfectly obedient to his father and God? 
He was perfectly obedient. Perfectly obedient. And listen to this. Despite his perfect obedience, Abraham was about to lose his son. And Isaac was about to die. Did you ever think about this? Despite his perfect obedience, Isaac was about to die. And you know what happened next? It was God who provided. Yahweh Yireh, the God who provided. And Isaac was saved, not through his obedience, but by the provision of God. So what is the solution to our situation? Okay, we've got that standard. And God looks at us, looks us at our hopeless situation, and he says, okay, hold on to me. I'm coming down. Hold on to me. I'll grab you. All you need to do, hold on to me, and I'll take you home. Amen and amen. He reaches down to me in my hopeless situation, and all he says, fix your eyes on me. That's it. Hold on to me. Hold on to me. This is what Paul meant when he said, for it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. Ellen White later said that this is the great doctrine, great controversy. She says that the great doctrine of justification by faith so clearly taught by Luther. God gave us Eternal life is a gift. You don't pay for it with your obedience. There are a couple of passages I would like to show you. And, and by the way, I've got two great books here. And I encourage you to read those books. One is Steps to Christ and one is Faith and Works. Both are amazing. Amazing. And this is a statement from, from Steps to Christ. Just listen to this. We do not earn salvation by... Can you say this? We do not earn salvation by obedience. Okay? For salvation is what? Free gift. To be received by faith. But obedience is what? Fruit. Can you read this with me again, everybody? Okay? So, so it gets into, into your minds. Let's read it together. We do not earn salvation by obedience. For salvation is a free gift of God to be received by faith. But obedience is the fruit of faith. Obedience is inseparable, inseparable from salvation. Another statement that I really love, I really love this statement, it's from Faith and Works. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in men and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition would be rejected as treason. As treason. I've got many statements like this that I could show you. So, in order to bring this a little bit further, to, to help us understand, I'd like to tell you a parable. Okay? It's, just a pa it's a parable, all right? So it's not a true story, it's a parable. Jesus used parables, so I can, I can do too. So you heard about Avondale College, right? What did you hear about Avondale College? I hope all good things. But anyway, you heard about this Advent, it's not college anymore, it's university. Okay? You heard about this great institution. You don't live in Australia. Okay, but you heard about it and you want to go and do your BA or, or master's. You know, you know it's a great school, great teachers, Christian education. And for the sake of the story, you, you, se you send an application six months in advance and you are accepted. But there is a catch. You have to pay for the first semester in advance. The problem is that you don't have money. So you think, how can I get to Australia? It's an expensive country. My country is poor. There's no perks from government. There's no hex, no anything. The exchange rate is bad. So I have a choice. Either forget about Avondale or save. So I decide to save. Okay? You want to go to Avondale, so you want to save, try to save money. You save the entire half a year. But you have a problem. You really don't earn that much. It's really not enough to save. You have to pay for rent, you have to buy food, you have to put petrol in your car, you have to 
pay for clothes, you have to pay for a doctor, even though you tried very hard, you save nothing. To add to this problem, you have, to have, a, you have a serious issue with your life. Nobody knows about this, but or at least you think nobody knows. You are a pornography addict. It's a secret that you spend a lot of money on the internet to pay for this addiction. You fight this tendency, but it doesn't work. Temptation is too great. And then you like to spend money on little gadgets. You, like, you see your friends having that new iPhone, and, and you really want it to, you know, and oh, well, what's the credit cards are for, right? So you buy your iPhone. Result is that you don't have the money. Shrugging your shoulders, you say, oh, well, I tried. I wanted to go to Avondale, but I can't. On the day of the registration, you call and say, hello, I, I'm sorry. I, I thought I could make it, but, but it's not going to happen. I'm sorry. There's a moment of silence. Could you please wait a second? I'm transferring you to the financial advisor, our student finance director. What's the point, you think? I will only be further embarrassed. Hello, can I help you? You give your name, explain your situation once again, and then she says, you don't know? You don't know? Your account is paid in full. You can come and begin your BA today. I was just writing an email confirming that. Paid in full? You are completely bewildered. You are stunned. There must be some mistake. I, I don't have any money. No, no, no. This is your name. There's no mistake. She says, what? How could that be? Where did the money come from? The advisor looks to her computer and, and gives you the name. Your older brother. You are completely stunned. Your brother knows everything about you. He knows about your sins, your problems, he knows about your overspending and a few other things you don't want anybody to know. Some years ago, you got angry and communication stopped. You haven't been in touch since. Despite all of this, somehow your brother heard that you want to come to Australia and study at Avondale and he pays for your education. Still stunned, you grab your phone and dial your brother's number. Hey, uh, I'm sorry I haven't been in touch for so long. Uh, are you okay? Uh, I'm calling to say thank you. It was very nice what you did for me. You, you really didn't have to. Uh, we would manage somehow. Let me make a deal with you. I will pay you back. No? Or at least half, please. No? Look, look, let me at least play, pay $100. I have to pay you something back. No, 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 states your brother. This is my gift for you. If you want to give something back, even $100 or $50 or even $5, my gift becomes a discount. It's no longer a gift. And now you can go to Avondale. And when you are in Avondale, you have to study hard to make the best of the opportunity. You have to conform to the standards of the school. Will you always get high distinctions? Most likely not. The standard is pretty high, as I know. Will you always behave exceptionally? Most likely not. The point is, you're already in. You're already in. You are accepted. The price has been paid. Last night, I did not behave exceptionally well. I was quite excited after the meeting, after talking to you, and, and I left this, this place here, and I, I was in the car, and I parked myself right there, somewhere on an alley, I think it was T3, and I started talking to my wife. I, downloaded, I just got the FaceTime thing and I started talking to her and I was so excited telling her about the meeting and she was telling me about her day, I was telling her about my day and, and, and so on and we were quite noisy. I didn't realize, I put her on the speakers, you know, and, and she was, uh, I, I thought I was in the car, I had privacy, nobody was seeing me, you know, I was just talking to my beloved and, and but the, the doors reverberated, you know. So, uh, you know, maybe 15 minutes into a conversation, there's a knock on my window. So I, I wonder what's happening. So I lowered the window and the person said, 
You know what? This is quite noisy. Can you go somewhere else? <laughs> I want to sleep. You know? Oh, I felt bad. I said, "Did you hear my conversation?" Yes, I heard everything he said. And I'm like, "Oh no!" And and I drove away, and I'm thinking, "What have I said? What have I said, honey? They heard everything we talked about." I don't share my secrets with many people except my wife. You know, there are secrets you only tell your wife. I'm thinking, like, what have I done? The, the whole camp will know my secrets now. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh man, that was a difficult evening for me. <laughs> difficult evening. I was thinking, how am I going to explain myself if I shared something that I nobody should know, and so on. And and you know, so I prayed and I went to sleep. In the morning, I decided I need to fix this situation. This morning. So I went to that alley, and the people who were there know. I went from caravan to caravan, asking, "Was it you <laughs> who knocked on my door, <laughs> on my window?" And everybody says, "No, we never heard anything." I'm like, "Never heard anything?" And then I talked to one lady, and she says, "Oh, maybe it was my friend who is in that caravan." So I'm thinking, "This is the last person I can ask. Maybe it was him." So I said, "Can you introduce me to him?" And and we walked to the thing. We we talk. I talk with her husband a little bit. And and then the the person comes out of the caravan and says, "Yes, this was me." <laughs> and I I apologized. I said this was unintentional. I just it just happened, you see. And what happened? There was repentance, there was forgiveness, and there was reconciliation. There was all smiles, but nobody asked me to leave the camp <laughs> because I did a wrong thing. Are you catching the point? Nobody asked me. I am in. I'm behind the gates. You know, I don't want to get out, and nobody told me to get out. But within the boundaries of the camp, I was safe. There was reconciliation, there was forgiveness, repentance, and so on. My friends, God knows everything about you. He knows you are not good enough. Still, he loves you and want to give you eternal life. Grace, there's no secrets with God. In spite of this, he embraces you as part of his family. Grace is something you don't deserve and you never will. In fact, the word "deserve" does not exist in God's vocabulary. Grace, there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. Grace is completely free. If you keep the commandments to go to heaven, if you are obedient so that you may go to heaven, salvation becomes a salary. This is not a new theology. I found it in Romans, in the book of Romans, chapter four, verse four. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but what? An obligation. So, here we are. You see, if we go up. And up and up and up will receive a reward for our obedience. This is payment. This is wages. This is salary. This is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God's righteousness is ours, and all we need to do is to hold on to Him. We contribute nothing. It is the teaching of the grace of God that makes biblical Christianity so different than any other religion in the world. I'd like you to watch this small video, short video, and then we'll talk about obedience. Hmm. No, that's not what I expected. <laughs> Once again, it's a very profound video. So. No. Dwayne, can we do something to watch this video? <laughs> we need grace. No. Okay. No, no. We can do it. We can skip it. Okay, we can skip. It's a profound video, but we're going to skip it. Okay. So let me just talk about something else. All right. This is all very nice, but what about keeping the commandments? I get God's grace, but what about obedience? Aren't we supposed to keep the commandments? Is it our movement about keeping the commandments? Did God not call us as Seventh Day Adventists to preach God's commandments? Isn't a part of our message all true? 
Pastor Yulden spoke a lot about obedience, and he's very correct in what he said. Obedience plays a vital role in the process of salvation. Absolutely. He was also correct when he went to the Gospel of John. And he gave us this thing here that remain in me and I will remain in you. Then you will bear much fruit. So what is the, what is the recipe for fruit in our life? It is remain in Jesus. Abide in Jesus. Hold on to Jesus. So what is our role? Hold on to Jesus. I don't want to repeat what Pastor Yulden said because you've been here in this meeting. So allow me to address the issue of obedience in another way, supplementary way to what he was saying. So I have a question for you. Okay? I have a question for you. You have to think hard about that question. Uh, it will be a quiz that, that will require a lot of mental energy. Have you ever been in love? <laughs> I would like to see a show of hands. All those people who at some point in their life were in love, can you raise your hands? Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. I will not ask if you were not in love, but obviously majority of you have been in love. So I have a question for you here. How does it feel to be in love? All right? How does it feel to be in love? Okay, I want to turn to your partner, whoever you're sitting with, and describe the feeling. How do you feel when you are in love? What, what, what happens with you when you are in love? Go on. Oh, I see lots of fun here. <laughs> I thought people who are coming to Grey Nomads forgot what is love. <laughs> that was a long time ago, right? No? <laughs> How does it feel to be in love? It's a great feeling, right? I saw a lot of smiles and, and just, it's a happy feeling to be in love. I've got the next question. How does it feel when our love is returned? Talk about this. When, when you love somebody deeply and then suddenly that person returns the love. How does it feel? Talk about this. What happens to you? <laughs> i got a third question for you. Question number three. This is an analytical question. How, oh, that is a, how does a person who is truly in love, how does they behave? Talk about this. Who person is truly in love with somebody, how do they behave in relationship? Hmm? <laughs> and a last question. Why? What makes a person behave that way? Hardest question. Go ahead, talk. <laughs> so let me tell you a story. I went once to a Polish Congress in 1988. And after that Congress, there was a camp in Hakwa. Anybody knows where Hakwa is? Okay. In Hakwa, it was of Polish youth from various churches around Australia. I was single. I was lonely as a puppy. I wanted to find somebody. And on that camp, I saw the most beautiful girl. Oh, she was so beautiful. But she was in Adelaide. And I was in Kurambong. In my finished, uh, big, I just finished my second year of college. And I thought, how can you have the relationship Newcastle, Avondale, and Adelaide? That's like 1,400 kilometers, right? So I kind of wondered, oh, may, may it's not going to happen. But when we met, I uh, came, and we had a brief chat. Uh, we had a chat for about uh, 15 minutes in that camp, okay, and I found out that she's from Adelaide, just 15 minutes, okay, and she told me, one day I'm thinking of coming to work at the Sydney, the Sen, because she was a physiotherapist at that stage. So I kind of held on to that thought when I left, okay, held on to that. I didn't know that she came home to her mother and said to her, I found the man I'm going to marry. <laughs> I didn't know that. So she packs her bags, and I don't know nothing about it,
She comes to Newcastle, and I'm sitting in church with my father's church, the Polish church in Newcastle. And the doors at the back open, and that girl walks in. And I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> you know? And then she made me chase her. <laughs> How do women do that? I don't know. She wanted to marry me, I had no idea. But she, she made me chase her. But I remember the moment, the moment when I grabbed her hand for the first time. It happened at Mount Sugarloaf. I was taking her up. We went for a picnic and I was taking her up. And I took all of, it took all of my courage to grab her hand. And guess what? She didn't pull it back. <laughs> she didn't pull her hand back. And I was like, Ah, you know, all the veins are busting here, and my heart is... You know how it feels. I, mean, I don't have to tell you. you. You know, this is the most common experience, right? You know, I fell in love. And I would do anything for the girl that I loved so deeply. We started going out, and I became the nicest guy you could find. I was buying bottles of Listerine, washing my mouth all the time, and everything, so everything would be nice and beautiful, you know? Uh, I still am, uh, to some extent. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, I would do anything she would ask me to do. I avoided things that would upset her. I quickly found out what things upset her. I changed my clothing style, I changed my eating style, I changed my hairstyle. I chose not to push the buttons that would upset her. I became a really, really nice person. The more I loved, the nicer I became. What is the point of all of this? I became nicer not to earn her love. I was already in love and she already made the decision to marry me. Are you getting the point? I was nice because I loved her. That was the point. We were in love. Do you catch the difference? I can be nice to to earn her love, or I'm already in love because I, I, I'm doing those things because I'm already in love with her. You know, when I was working on my doctorate in America, one of the requirements that they force us poor students to do, and we have to pay a lot of money for this, is to learn German and French. Not to speak, but to read. And you have to do it in two semesters. That's a total torture, especially German. French is nice, kind of German is this. Uh. But anyway, so I spent the whole spring semester learning German, learning all those words. And I'm like, why do I have to do this? Uh, now I wouldn't have to because now I've got translators on my phone, but then I had to do this. You know, and I had to learn all those words. I would learn 20 words per day and I forget them the next day. And it was like a one big drudgery. But you cannot be accepted to the PhD program unless you do German and French. So I had to study German. It was the total tragedy. All my friends were going and smelling flowers in May because it was spring in Michigan, going swimming in the Lake Michigan. And I had to study that German. <laughs> <laughs> But tell me, what would happen if the girl I fell in love with would speak only German? <laughs> what would happen then? Oh, I would spend 10, 12, 14 hours learning German. Because I would, my desire would be to communicate, right? To tell her that I love her. How is it? Ich liebe dich, right? No, whatever. Okay. Uh, to, to tell her that I love her, that I really w express my love for her. I would study German day and night. You see the difference? So what does all of this have to do with obedience? Very simple. Very simple. In the Bible, God reveals himself to us in a variety of ways. So we find God as a tower, as a rock, as a shepherd, shield, Potter, warrior, even mother hen. There are many metaphors for God. But the most prevalent picture of God that you find from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible is a lover. 
A guy who falls in love with his girl. From Genesis to Revelation, God is a lover, desperately in love with his beloved. In Revelation 21, 2, we find those words. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as what? Bright. Adorned for her husband. Who is the beloved of God? You and me. His people. In Ephesians, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for it. That gave himself up is a very important Greek word because it signifies that he was dying on the cross for Jorge. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Jesus and his church. God loves you in the same way you love that boy. God loves you in the same way you love that girl. He uses this image because it is the most intense feeling in human experience to love somebody. And God says to us, just love me. Fall in love with me. All he wants is to love, to be loved back. And just like the person with whom you love, you want to do the best for that person. You want to not, don't want to hurt that person in any way. You don't want to do the best for her or him. You want to protect him or her. You always want to do the best for them. You do not do those things because you want to. You want the other person to love you. You do this because you are in love. You know what I'm talking about. Same with God. He's your creator. He loves you desperately. He knows what is best for you. He knows that you feel you are not good enough. He knows that. People who truly know God, the lover in the Bible, follow his commandments. Not to earn his love, not to get to heaven. If, if we keep commandments to get to heaven, then heaven is a reward for keeping of the commandments. No, we keep the commandments because we are his pride. We are his bride because we've fallen in love with God. A God who came to this earth to slave for us. This is a huge paradigm shift from one way of understanding salvation. Suddenly you, you put it with a framework of love and love is everywhere in the New Testament. Have you noticed? From everywhere. Two great commandments and then you read the first John and it's just like overflowing with love, you know. God loves you. Just like this. And because I know my God, I know that he loves me desperately to die for me on the cross. I am obedient. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to hurt my relationship with God. In my opinion, this is the true understanding of biblical obedience. Because commandments are written on the heart. You know? And it happens in a very mysterious way when you fall in love. Commandments, you know what the rules of relationships are, but then they begin to be written on the heart. It happened to us something very interesting at some point. Our girls are 15 and 17 at that stage. We're attending Pioneer Memorial Church, and they go to the youth group. Pioneer Memorial Church is a big, big church. At that stage, before COVID, uh, a youth Sabbath school, there were about two, three hundred kids. So they had to divide in, in groups. And one of the leaders of, of the group which, in which my girls were participating, uh, he was my student at the seminary. And as soon as this church service finished, he's searching for us because he wants to tell us about our girls something. And he says, to us, he stops both my wife and us. He says, you have a very weird home. Your girl said something totally weird. You need to explain yourself to me. And he says, your girl said there are no rules in your house. No rules in our house? Well, we could think of plenty of rules in our house. I'll give you an example. Very strict rules, no electronics in the bedroom. Very strict rule. Uh, another strict rule, clean your, clean your bedroom, you know, before you go anywhere. Uh, there are plenty of rules, no talking back, you know, and many others. So what happened? What happened? When they are publicly able to say, 
we have no rules in our. They couldn't think of a single rule to tell because the, the, the guy asked, what are rules in your house? So my goes, we don't have any rules. <laughs> you know, what happened? The rules of our house, because we operate according to the principle of love, we're not perfect by any means, but we love our girls to beats. The commandments of our household were written on their hearts. And when the commandments are written on their hearts, you don't even know you obey. They didn't know what were the rules. So we have a choice, either to speak a lot about commandments, or strive to have the commandments being written on our hearts. And this is the huge paradigm shift from the commandments written on the stone to the commandments written on the heart. Because we love. Because God is loving us just like that. Jesus comes down. And he fulfills all the obedience so that we may live. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are counted righteous. Let me just rephrase this a little bit. If you give yourself to him, and accept him as your savior. Then if you think you're not good enough. For his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character. And you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. And this is just not just once. This is a life story. If you come to Jesus every single day. And claim 1 John 1, 9, you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. Did you catch that? Remember that slide with the angel, right? This used to be my understanding. It used to be my understanding. And that scared me a lot. So I decided that I'm going to do some adjustments to that picture. And I did this. So, I'm there. I'm definitely there. But Jesus is in front of me. Jesus is behind me. Jesus is on my right side. He's on my left side. He's above me. He's below me. That angel does not see me. I'm there. But that angel is not talking to me. He's talking to Jesus. And what is Jesus telling him? Look, this guy is covered by my righteousness. You have no right to speak this guy. Speak to me, boy. <laughs> that angel now is scared. <laughs> Jesus makes me invisible through his righteousness. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing? And it's free. Free of charge. But this is not the end of the story by any means. John 15. The fruits will come out if your relationship with Jesus. And Ellen White says this in Steps to Christ. That's why I love Steps to Christ. More than this. Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith. And the continual surrender of your will to him. So long as you do this. He will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. She's quoting my favorite passage in the Bible. Philippians 2.13, it's the passage that saved me. Because when I was in the deepest agony, whether I'm good enough for God, when I'm good enough for God, am I good enough? Will I stand in the judgment? I read Philippians 2.13 and it changed my life. Because then I realized, it is God who works in me. All I need to do is to fix my eyes on Jesus. Fix my eyes on Jesus. Then, with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness and works of obedience. And this is where we find all about keeping the commandments. If Jesus lives in your heart, you will be obedient and will not even know it. God will work in you according to his good pleasure. And this is a promise. 
So in the scripture, and in those statements of Ellen White, we find a complete gospel of Jesus Christ. We are reckoned, accounted, considered as righteous, and changed into his image. The change is the work of Christ in me. Keeping the commandments is a result of relationship with Christ. It's inseparable. When you are in relationship with Christ, you will keep the commandments. Did you know that the Ten Commandments can be read in another way? Not just thou shalt, but there, there's grammatically possible way of keeping the commandments. If you, how, how is it go? If you, I, uh, if you love me, not, not, there's no word love, but I shall promise you that you will do that. You can read it in grammatical, this is grammatically correct. I promise you, you will do that. If you stay in the cabin, if I will be the one God for you, you will, type of situation. So it's a different kind of reading of the commandments. Entire process of salvation is by the grace of Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Amen. No cheap grace here. No cheap grace here. Oh, and one more thing. And I could have another sermon on this. What is the purpose of obedience? I have just one passage and we'll, I'll sit down. In Matthew 5.16, it stands out. Stand out. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen and amen. And this is why with Apostle Paul, I resolved to preach Christ and him crucified. This is all about his wonderful grace. The more you fix your eyes on Jesus, and this takes works. It discipline to be with Jesus, to walk with Jesus, take discipline, you know. It's work when you read your Bible, you make time to, uh, to pray. The more you do that, God will reshape you. God will work with you. As it is said in Hebrews chapter 12, fix your eyes on Jesus. Can you finish it for me? Fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. Fall in love with your Savior, and He will do miracles in your life by His grace. Let me conclude with a story. Richard Seltzer, the surgeon, tells of a young man and woman he just operated on. Dr. Seltzer writes, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies. Her face is post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be thus from now on. I had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh. I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor from her cheek, I had to cut the little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they? I ask myself. He and this woman with the tortured mouth I have made who gaze at and touch each other so generously, so greedily. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth be always like this? Yes, I say, it will. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent. But the young man smiles. I like it, he says. It's kind of cute. All at once, I know who he is. I lower my gaze. Unmindful of me, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth. And I, so close, I can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that their kiss still works. I hold my breath and let the wonder in. Jesus, like that young man, like that young husband, twisted his body on the cross to let you know that the kiss still works.